the long calm has finally passed and the promise once made has been delivered. Mostly. Arguably the most anticipated game of all time is upon us, Square Enix's reimagining of their seminal PS1 classic Final Fantasy VII. But is this the reunion that the series fans have been asking for, or are they simply draining the source material dry with a heartless Mako reactor? There is some real controversy here which I will detail, so stick around to the end of the video to see my out of 10 score and full breakdown of the game. Welcome to Mr. Conman's review of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Before moving forward, it's only fair to warn that in this video I will be delving into certain aspects of the story in a relative way. I won't be spoiling specific events, but I will be giving my thoughts on the direction it's taking and changes made from the original game. If you want to go in blind, turn away now and come back to the video when you're done with the game. With that said, let's move on. Final Fantasy VII Remake takes place entirely in the city of Midgar, a city of two tales. A large technologically advanced, bustling metropolis divided into eight sectors and fueled by power plants that siphon Mako energy, a precious natural resource, from the earth. In the shadow of this city, however, lies its dark underbelly, the slums, and here is where you will spend most of your playtime. The slums is populated by the underclass of Midgar, people who can't afford to live on the plate-shaped city above and who survive on the scrap that regularly falls from the sky. Although the slums is literally a place constructed from the throwaway leftovers of the city above, the visuals of the game are of such a high quality that Square Enix manages to make this derelict place in parts look absolutely stunning. I reviewed this game and captured all the footage on the base PlayStation 4 and if it's not the best looking game on the console, it's certainly in the top three. Uh, for the most part, character models of your main party are absolutely second to none. From the threading of the material on their clothes, to the ability of their faces to emote, adds a depth of realization to the cast that makes them instantly endearing, and it's a credit to the animations that you can often gather what they're thinking or feeling without so much as a line of dialogue to guide you. Huh? Say that again! However, it's not without its visual blemishes. There is significant issues with certain environmental textures not loading in on time or even loading at all. Early in the game, there is a room in which you can rest and save, and the front of this door simply never loads. It causes a very jarring image to watch the player character, Cloud Strife's highly detailed character model, reach for a door, and in doing so, somehow manage to reach back in time to a door from the Nintendo 64 era and open it. It's quite possible that this is a bug that will get patched later, but for the duration of my playthrough it was an issue. I don't want to make it sound like it's that common, however, as the vast majority of the game still looks exceptional. Strolling through the alleys of the Sector 7 slums, the city of Midgar feels more alive than ever before, with a near constant hum of conversations going on around you, televisions displaying the most recent newscast or Shinra propaganda, and people getting on with their daily lives. You will start to feel a kinship with the hardy people of the slums, having to deal with their meagre lifestyle but remaining hopeful and even finding groups of children playing with toy swords or games of hide and seek. Beyond the main narrative driven scenario, in each chapter you are given a list of possible odd jobs to do, anything ranging from clearing an abandoned factory of the monsters that now live there, or seeking information for a journalist about the Angel of the Slums. Far from being just fetch quests however, these quests are extremely well contextualised. After all, Cloud is a mercenary for hire, so it makes perfect sense that he would be doing odd jobs on the side as well as working for Avalanche. Cloud, you've exceeded my expectations. I hope you will continue to help me gather vital information for my research. These quests are usually quite rewarding, not as narratively interesting as something like The Witcher 3 side quests, but certainly a cut above the average modern Final Fantasy game. They are also missable as the game takes a bit of a linear approach if you don't do them on your first opportunity. You cannot revisit certain areas or quests if you don't do them before progressing the story, however the game does a good job of warning you of this and you will want to do them anyway, so it's not to the game's detriment. The dialogue and voice cast throughout is exemplary with a few minor flaws. Mako is the lifeblood of our world. The planet bleeds green like you and me bleed red. The hell you think's gonna happen when it's all gone, huh? Answer me! But gone are the days of the hokey Final Fantasy X laughing scene. <laughs> which I think we can all happily forget and replaced with a much more natural level of quality with an ability to make you feel. 
Whether it's sadness, anger or laughter, you will feel how the party members feel. And this is a credit to the new voice cast, who more than adequately fill the shoes of your party members. In my review of the demo, which I will link at the end, I highlighted the features of the battle system, so I won't touch upon absolutely everything here, but having now finished the game, I can say what was already very strong is now fully realised and even more in depth. The game frequently encourages you to switch characters regularly, as each character's abilities will come into play in different scenarios. Barrett or Aerith can use long ranged attacks to swipe down flying enemies or even just to stay out of harm's way. Cloud and Tifa take a melee approach and deal significantly more damage with their base attacks, but as a result are more in harm's way themselves. Throughout the game's lengthy 45 to 50 hour campaign, you will collect several weapons for each character, each of which comes with its own unique special move, which your character can permanently learn by using the ability in battle. This incentive to use each weapon at least for a set amount of time to gain its abilities, in my opinion is a masterstroke to encourage various gameplay styles, and the feeling of gaining these abilities through battle makes the combat system feel like it's constantly on an upward trajectory. There is enough variety in enemies and weapon types as well as spells and abilities that the combat system never gets stale. Add in the fact that each weapon carries its own levelling trajectory in something akin to Final Fantasy X's Sphere Grid, allowing you to upgrade the abilities and stats of the weapon. It also means that you could viably keep your favourite weapon equipped throughout the entire game and depending on your choices, it may even be beneficial. The Materia system also makes a triumphant return to form here. A crystallised and refined form of the Earth's natural resource, Mako, Materia stones carry the knowledge of magic and when slotted into your equipment, gives your character the ability, spell or passive buff attached to the stone. This system, with its colour coding of types, benefits and negative effects on stats and use within battles can seem complicated, but is thoroughly explained in tutorials and will of course be especially familiar to anyone who has played the original game. It works much the same as it did before. The stones slot into your armour or weapon and throughout battle level up and gain new forms. To put it more simply, fire eventually becomes Fyra, blizzard eventually comes Blizzara, and so on. You will also acquire summoning materia, red Mako stones infused with the knowledge of ancient beasts or deities who when called forth will either deal massive damage to your foes or provide some much needed passive assistance to your party. I won't spoil or detail each summon here as seeing them firsthand is truly a sight to behold. Finding the right combination of materia for each character is fun and rewarding in and of itself. I would argue essential to get the most out of the game. You might find yourself getting completely stomped by one of the game's exhilarating boss fights only to find that a quick change up of your materia and strategy will make the fight completely achievable on your next try. The game offers three optional difficulties, easy, classic and normal. I played on normal throughout with a bit of a fear that it would be too easy, but I've seen the game over screen enough times that it definitely justifies the category. Upon completing the game, the hard difficulty option appears in the chapter select mode. In this mode, items are locked out and I am excited to try my second playthrough and see how I get on with the bosses. Come on. This one's for you. The story of Final Fantasy VII Remake is largely the same as the 1997 PS1 classic, with embellishments and reimaginings of scenes that for the most part are excellent additions. As a fan of the series, I was genuinely worried about taking the first six or so hours of Final Fantasy VII and dragging it out over the course of a 40 hour release, but Square Enix has done a masterful job justifying this and staying true to the source. As an ex-Shinra soldier and mercenary for hire, Cloud Strife is hired by an estranged childhood friend, Tifa Lockhart, on behalf of her eco-terrorist cell, Avalanche. It's it's just... you've really changed. How? I suppose it's... yeah, your eyes. They used to be less... It's the Mako. Soldier, remember? to battle against arms dealer turned power company Shinra. The Shinra Electric Power Company serve as the main antagonist of the campaign, a shady capitalist organization draining the Mako energy from the planet to fuel a more modern way of life for the people, but have amassed obscene wealth while doing so. These sewer rats appear to call themselves Avalanche, sir. Avalanche leader Barrett Wallace is a charismatic extremist with a heart who wants people to live more of a simple life, disowning the Shinra technology, causing harm to his beloved planet. The dichotomy of Barrett's crusade is fantastically realised in this outing and may be the highlight of the entire game for me. Balancing his hatred of capitalism and his by any means necessary approach to tear it down against the backdrop of being a devoted father to his daughter Marlene and a pillar of strength and inspiration to his crew. Ain't no stopping this train we're on, son. A lot of people risk their lives to get it rolling. 
a shining example of how the characters and narrative have been expanded. This extends to the rest of the cast in seeing Avalanche fighting for a good cause, but also having to deal with the fact that their extremist and violent approach sometimes causes as much harm as good. The blossoming friendship between Tifa and Aerith will tug at your heartstrings while they both vie for Cloud's approval, and supporting Avalanche cast Biggs, Wedge and Jesse have been promoted from backdrop roles to fully integral parts of the story. Jesse, in particular, constantly flirting with Cloud has gone on to become an enormous fan favourite with her over-the-top, positive attitude, sarcasm and ability to make Cloud feel uncomfortable in a comedic way that sometimes even drags him out of his shell. Not only are the environments in this game visually updated, but they're also given a fleshed out, conceptual upgrade as well. As an example, the haunted and abandoned train graveyard used to simply serve as a puzzle and as an excuse to include ghosts as an enemy type. Here, however, the ghosts are given context and the reason that they haunt the train graveyard is explained to you throughout the puzzle to an enormous benefit of the world building. Other locations like Don Corneo's mansion, Wall Market and Aerith's house are given much the same treatment and I often just sat and slowly spun the camera around and took in the sights and sounds. As someone who played the original game 23 years ago, it felt as if Square Enix had projected my childhood memories in fully realised 3D images and allowed me to explore them as slowly and as thoroughly as I wanted. There is an unrivaled feeling of nostalgia here that will make you so grateful that this game exists. Midgar is now swelling with vending machines and shops aplenty. The game incentivizes you to check every shop or vending machine as there is an element of randomness as depending on where you are in the story some vendors will have a sale on otherwise expensive items. Some vendors even sell collectible music discs that you can play at jukeboxes dotted throughout the city. Mind if I build the items you buy as local Merc's favorites? They'll fly off the shelves. Which brings us steadily to the soundtrack of the game. I cannot praise the music of this game highly enough. From the use of familiar character melodies into new themes, note for note remakes of original favourites, right up to bouncing new drum and electro infused tracks, across the board the soundtrack will almost definitely sweep the category at every game awards show for the rest of the year. They even have the sound mixing done correctly, something that in modern games I find is now a rarity. Swelling music or sudden explosions and other combat noise never drowns out character speech during cutscenes or battles, a problem that I find more frequently in modern games, often having to go into the settings and lower the volume of ambient sound to be able to hear the dialogue. This is not an issue here. It's also worth drawing a highlight to the many animations in the game, from all of the battle mechanics to the NPCs working out casually at the gym, to Cloud shielding his eyes from the bright lights. For the most part, this reimagining of Final Fantasy VII has been a resounding success but this is where reviewing the game gets a little bit complicated. Without spoiling anything specific, Square Enix have made narrative choices, particularly towards the end of the campaign, that for me will simply alienate newcomers to the series and anger longtime fans. Some of these changes will have irreparable implications for the future of the remake series. Throughout the game you encounter the Whispers or the Arbiters of Fate, a wispy unknown supernatural force draped in black cloaks and a completely new addition to the story, not to be confused with the also black cloaked clones. The Arbiters of Fate, who wish to keep the planet on the course it is predestined to take, or in other words the original game's plot, are often encountered throughout the game, usually any time that the plot starts to deviate from the original story. Fighting these whispers off allows the party to enact minor changes to the plot used to justify changes from the source material and making the player interact with these whispers then makes you feel liable for changing the events of the story, which I'm not sure that anybody actually wanted. As I said, I will not highlight what these changes are, but I would feel remiss if I didn't take it into account in scoring this review. The late introduction of story beats to the game that I feel have no place in the plot, especially considering the game has been labelled a remake and not a reboot may even go as far as to undermine the project completely. Essentially, 98% of the game plays out along the train tracks of the original, and the last 2% starts to show the fingerprints of director Tetsuya Nomura's Bizarro Land reimaginings. If you've seen the movie Advent Children, you will have some idea of what this means. Again, I will not detail the specifics here, I may do another video about that in the future, but for now all I will say is that it did significantly affect how I felt at the end of the game versus how I felt throughout the game, and it has played into my final score. And that's all there is to it. Sure there isn't something else going on? Um. 
Final Fantasy VII Remake, at least mechanically, is in my opinion the best Final Fantasy game released since the PS2 era, a triumph in modern RPG mechanics and gaming in general, blazing a trail and showing us again that Square Enix really is a power to be reckoned with in the RPG genre, a compelling and engaging commentary on capitalism, human greed and the folly of plundering the natural resources from the earth. Unfortunately, it does fall at the last hurdle, and new narrative elements throw the upcoming continuations of the series into disarray. An excellent game overall, but be prepared for a little bit of a bait and switch. My final Mr. Conran remake score of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, I score the game an 8.8 .8 out of 10. I have to highlight here that this has been a difficult score to give, and had I reviewed the game based on the first 45 hours rather than the whole 50 hours, it would likely have been a near perfect 9.8, possibly even a 10. So, this was my complicated and difficult review of the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Thank you for watching, I hope it was informative. <laughs> Until we meet again, my friend! Here's where you normally ask some sort of question for the comment section, so... Tifa or Earth, will you be going for the Platinum Trophy? Let me know in the comments below and I will get back to you. If you enjoyed this video, why not check out my review of the Final Fantasy VII Remake demo where I go a little bit more in depth into the combat system, or my unboxing of the Soldier First Class Edition where I almost break my ankles running down the stairs to get to the delivery man. Please also consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and don't leave out the bell icon to receive notifications of any future videos that I do, it really helps the channel grow and keeps these videos moving. I've been Mr. Coneman, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Stay safe. It's Wu Tai, isn't it? Let me get my gun. I'll teach him to mess with Midgar.